Okay, good morning. Hi, and welcome to lecture 17 of quantum physics for non-physicists, and today is the 10th of November. Okay, and today we'll keep talking about modeling uncertainty like we did last few lectures, uh, and this time we'll talk about uncertainty about the evolution, not about a static state. So we'll talk about uh, the concept of quantum channels and reversible evolution. Okay, and the daily analogy today is comparing uh, lectures to burgers. So, of course, that lectures are much nicer in person, uh, not just, you know, not just because the pace is different, but also because we can interact more, I can see your faces, I can see if you're following, you can ask questions in the moment, that's uh, much easier, you can, like, uh, correct, correct little um, typos, etc. live. And, and also it's better for the students to like meet each other and go through this as a collective experience as opposed to being home at home. But then, you know, there's, there's higher reasons. So we learned about the coronavirus and the harm that it causes to be there. So now we switch to courses online, which are not quite there, right? They're not quite the same. So it's the same as for me, it was with burgers. Burgers are uh, delicious. They have very practical food. You can eat them uh, anywhere with one hand even. And, you know, then eventually you learn about the harm that exists in the meat industry, especially for uh, animals like cows and pigs. And you think, okay, I can't do this anymore. At least that's what happened to me, I don't know, 20 years ago. And then at the time, the alternative, like the online lectures, the burgers were really bad. They tasted like sole of a shoe and they had the same consistency. You know, but with time, then we had this phase of bean burgers that were good, they were their own thing, or trying to imitate meat. And now these days they have all types of uh, high-tech burgers that are made of pea protein, for example, and which tastes really like, like the real thing. So what I'm trying to say is that keep hope. Uh, it took vegan burgers only 20 years to get there, but I'm sure that online classes will get much better uh, very soon. Okay. And in that note about housekeeping today, I can start uh, processing some of the feedback that I've, uh, you gave. So, so far about 10% of the students have given some kind of feedback through this survey. If you have not yet, then you still have time because I'll keep reading this throughout the semester. But we can already go over some of the points you made. So in general, people thought that the lectures were interesting and that we explain relatively well things, but there are some, uh, some flaws that we can now try to correct. So the first thing that I felt most people suffered from was not having lecture notes in LaTeX, that every, everything more streamlined, more clear, and more, um, yeah, just structured in general. Okay, so we're on it. So there's two students who volunteered to to write some of the lecture notes and I'll give them my feedback. I don't have time to, to do all of this on my own, but there's hope that, I don't know, in a few weeks, we'll have a first draft of, of LASIK uh, lecture notes. The second one, and thank you so much for the people who called my attention to this, uh, is that I learned that, so there's only credits for the computer science bachelors and not for the masters for this course, and also for um, QAP that's given in the next semester. So, I don't know how this happened. So this was some miscommunicating, miscommunication between our admin and the admin in the, in the computer science department. So uh, I wrote some emails and let's see what happens, okay? I don't know if it will be on time to uh, change things for this semester, but probably for next semester it will be okay. Good, uh, the next point was about this handwritten notes. I should split them into uh, shorter files because they start to be very, heavy and also go through them and try to hunt some typos that are there. So I'll do this uh, today, if not today, then tomorrow. Then you've asked me about these coding sessions that I had promised a while ago. So this will be, um, there's a, an online platform that's like Code Academy for quantum, um, for quantum programming. And so we'll be able to have some tutorials there. So some sessions where you can go and actually uh, called some quantum states and some circuits and evolve them, etc. So the problem with this is that uh, because it's a startup and the product is still in beta, we've tested it before for a summer school, but um, 
there's legally some agreement contracts that need to be signed between ETH and them. And now our legal team is talking to their legal team and hopefully this will be solved within a week or two. Let's see. Uh, then several people noticed that some of the terminology is unclear. So this means I say some terms and I don't explain what they are uh, or I assume you, you already know them. And this is, yeah, it's particularly unfortunate that the first time I'm teaching this course when I'm not yet familiar with what you know and you don't know, um, it's online <laughs> and most of you are not watching the lectures live. So by the time you'd give me feedback on what terms are unclear, it's been already maybe two or three lectures of me mentioning them. Still, I'd be very, very happy to like just do a, a recap of unclear terms, but I need to know which ones. Okay, so uh, everyone said unclear terminology, but nobody said uh, specific examples of what is unclear. So I think I'll send an email around with a, a doodle where we can write which terms are unclear. And finally, uh, everyone liked the, that I do recaps or show the big picture at the beginning of the lecture, so I'll keep doing this. Okay. So, just to see where we are again, we're still here mod looking at ways in, of modeling uncertainty and reading uncertainty at the, at the level of states. And now we're going to do uncertainty at the level of evolution. Yep. Um, yes, and then the goal is that we can look at problems in quantum thermodynamics uh, very soon. So probably next week already. Okay. Let me just recap what we did in the last two lectures. So we talked about uncertainty about the quantum state. Uh, and we saw, well, if we don't know if there's a state psi i with probability pi, but could be either of them, then we can represent it by this object that's a matrix, which we call a density matrix, that is the weighted sum of this state. Okay, this can represent any kind of uncertainty. And a particular type of uncertainty that we saw was when we we don't have the global picture, we only have local pictures. So there's several subsystems, different Hilbert spaces. Um, we have like a global state, which could be a pure or already a mixed state, meaning that um, there's more than one state in this decomposition. And we only have local information. So we don't know what's going on on subsystem B, for example, we only know what's going on on A. And the way to model this was through this object that was the partial trace. Okay. And then we saw that the uh, measurement outcome probabilities were given by trace of the projector into this outcome and the state, the density matrix of the state, we saw that it evolved like this. And then we looked at a specific case for a local uh, evolution. So this means you have an evolution that's UA tensor UB. So system A evolves according to UA, system B evolves according to UB. And then we saw that, well, in this special case, we can either do the global evolution, get the evolved global state, and then trace out one subsystem and see only the reduced state. Or we can take the reduced state and then evolve only the local evolution. Uh, yes, the local evolution, UA. OK. And what we'll do today is what if, what if the evolution is not of this form? And also, um, so that would be the version of this for uh, evolutions, but we'll also do the version of this for evolution. So what, what if, um, what if you have uncertainty about the evolution about from any other thing? Okay. So I'll give some examples. So now today we'll talk about uncertainty about Evolution. Okay, and in particular, irreversible uh, evolution. So one option is that maybe we don't have enough information about what happened. So we could think about again of this um, about this machine. So for example. We can think again about this machine. So suppose that this machine creates some state rho that we already saw, it's a superposition of many states. And then we go through another machine that evolves a state, okay? And something comes out on the other side, and there we are. Uh, 
Okay. And now, so suppose that here, with probability pi, we apply the unitary ui. And then the question is, oh, well, what information does uh, Bob here have about the state at the end? And it's going to be exactly the same thing. So in this case, we have rho evolves to a series of the states, and we know how each of them looks like. It's pi, the evolved state of rho, so it'd be ui dagger, uh, ui rho, ui dagger. So this is really just applying the same reasoning as we had before. But now we could say, well, maybe this, we just call this the evolution of rho. And this thing here, we'll, we'll be calling it a, a channel. I'll give you some, I'll give you some um, example of this later. So this is number one. Number two could be, well, you know, maybe, maybe we do know what the global uh, evolution was, but we, we're lacking some local information. So this could be the example of, well, maybe I have row A coming here that I know, okay, but there's some sigma B or E for environment that I don't know. I evolve them according to some unitary UAE, for example, which I know. And then I, I'm asking what is, what is left here. So an example, a physical example of this could be, well, maybe row A is a state uh, that you control. Maybe it's like the state of your quantum circuit, but it's in contact with some environment. Okay. And you don't know the exact state of the environment. It's, it's a version of having noise in a system. Okay. Then you have some joint evolution. And then you ask what's there. And this could be known or unknown again. But in this case, so what we have is that if your row A evolves to what? So we're going to, at the end, trace out E because we want the reduced state on A. And here we had UAE. Uh, o A tensor sigma E. E A E dagger. Right. And so these are two examples of, and this I can call this again. I call this this whole process the the evolution. This will be the channel. Okay, so these are two examples where we could have some kind of uncertainty about the, the evolution, either because we don't know which unitary is applied for some reason, or because we don't know uh, what other states our state is interacting with, even if we know what the interaction is. And this, this is very, very common whenever we have to model noise or model some system in some uh, thermal environment, for example. So then these are two examples. And now we can ask, what's the most general case? Of evolutions. And now not, we can see later that both of these evolutions are, if we don't know, if you don't know this, then they're both non-reversible. OK, so what are we looking for again? In the more general case, so we're looking for some functions, for some objects. Or let's just call maps. That map. take, say, valid density operators to valid density operators. 
So we want to be able to represent any evolution that can happen in nature. So the only restriction is that it should take valid states, valid quantum states to valid quantum states. But this is already enough to, uh, to restrict things a lot. So they need to be what? The first one uh, is going to be that they need to be linear. Because just like in this example that we saw before, right, uh, this example up here, we wanted to kind of respect this notion of probability that we have. So we want to have, well, I didn't know if I had, um, P1, no, let me just do a general case, sum of I. If I didn't know which of the states I had, which state row I had with probability p i, and then I evolve them, I want the result to be the same as summing over i, p i, the evolution of each of these states, right? So it respects this behavior for probabilistic mixtures of states. Good. This is what we want. We want it to be trace preserving. So this is trace of rho is the same as a trace of the evolved version of rho. Uh, what this means in particular is that um, the final state can still be interpreted as a probabilistic mixture of pure states. Okay, so I'll just write here. Uh, let's call this rho prime sum over i of some p i. Okay, because um, because the trace of the density matrix is the sum of these p i's. If this is the diagonal, okay. If these are all orthonormal. If they form a basis, so it's a spec. Let's call the spectral decomposition orthonormal basis. Then the sum of the matrix, uh, sorry, the sum of these probabilities is given by the trace of the matrix. So we want this to re be respected by the evolution. So what it also means is that there's no post selection, but we'll get to post selection later, maybe in another course. So. And we want something. So do you remember that um, when you had the density matrix, row A, no, let me try to that long. We had that any density matrix was larger than zero, right? And we want that with the map. If we apply this map, the result is still positive. Okay, so we want when this map is applied to any density matrix P, it is still positive. But we want um, we want that this is also true when there's several subsystems and you you're able to do nothing in one of them. Okay, so I apply uh, this this map on the first one and the identity on the second one. Okay. This identity, by the way, is abuse of notation. This is not a matrix, it's a, it's a function. Okay. okay, so this just says, well, even after I apply the, the um, evolution on the subsystem, the global state should still be a physical state, which means it's still positive in particular. Uh, there are some examples of some maps that look physical if you only look at a subsystem but then if you look at the at the bigger picture then you get that this is not the case uh, one example is uh, transpose okay. so if you had 
if you have this map just taking row A and, and doing the transpose, okay. if you look at it locally, it, the row A is still positive. But if you look at row AB, then it can become negative. In fact, it can become negative for entangled states. Okay. So that's just to tell you why, why we do it in this way. And this is called being completely positive. Good. So what maps satisfy this? Uh, so overall, we saw that these are maps that act on density matrix on a, on a given subsystem. And they map them to density matrices. And now there's no specific reason why the, the initial and final subsystem should be the same. So most of cases, they will be. But sometimes you can think of a map that does compression. So it goes from a larger system to a smaller system, for example. So the initial and final systems don't need to be the same. So, uh, so these are maps. So now let's just call row from A. Now let's suppose that they go to a different system B. And they may start on what? They add on density matrices. We saw that we call the space of density matrices S. It's a subspace of the, of the endomorphism, so we can just write endomorphisms on HA, which are isomorphisms from the space to itself, right? Matrices, essentially matrices to end. So a map from states on A to states on B. So state that satisfy one, two, and three are called not very, um, not very creatively press preserving phrase preserving completely positive maps. Okay, some people call it CPDPMs, just so you know. Okay, so it turns out that these three conditions that we saw before, they are necessary and sufficient to characterize all physical states, so we can find exam uh, physical transformations, we can find examples of physical evolutions uh, that explore all these possibilities um, given by just these constra constraints. So, there are several ways of representing these maps, so we'll look into some of them. Our presentations of TPCPMs, which are also called channels sometimes. So sometimes they're called quantum channels. So number one, it's called the cross decomposition. And we'll see some examples in a bit. So it's also called the operator sum decomposition. And that's just saying that the map applied to row, if we see from those conditions, you can derive that it has to have this form. EK is going to be some matrix, rho, prime. Okay, this is just like we saw before with the unitaries. Uh, what was this example? That was this example here. So they need to satisfy some conditions with sum over K. Oh. E k chuk, e k equals the identity on a on the initial space. Uh, this condition is just so we have normalization, so that we have the being trace preserving. So this are called cross operators.
so let me let's look at some examples of this so that we understand better what, what we mean. Number one, the easiest one. So we have the unitary map. Okay, so there we have that a state evolves as just u rho u dagger. It satisfies that u dagger u is the identity just like we wanted, okay, on the original system. So it's the special case where there's only one of these operators. Now let's call what, let's look at what is called the erasure channel. which is a very annoying channel. So it just takes any state rho A to another state, uh, which is going to be a fixed state. OK, so essentially, it's this machine where a state comes in, I discard it, and I just go from my collection of pure states on B, and I give this. So it really erases whatever information there was there in, in the original state. Well, in this case, we have again u of uh, rho. It's going to be the sum over k of the stage. Yeah. So on b, k on a rho, k on a where this k is on A form a basis, uh, an orthonormal basis. And you can see that this is true because, I mean, if you look at it, this is a number, right? This is a number, and now you have here a cat and a brass, which don't depend on k, so you can take them out. Okay, so we, in the end, we're going to have a cat and a bra, it's a matrix, and multiplied by this number. So we just take the number out. So we have absolute row. B, and then we have this left here. Okay, this is all on A. But this thing that we got here, this is just a trace of A, of rho. Because the case form a basis, and that's one, as we know. Okay, so then, I can forget about this part, and we get indeed that the final state is always this fixed state. So these are two very extreme examples of channels. And just to check that we, uh, that we satisfy the condition. Well, let's just see. So we want that um, E, sorry, sum over K, sum over K of EK dagger EK. So EK is this each of this. Right, that's EK. And on the other side is EK dagger. Good. Well, so this is gonna be sum over K. Well, first the other one, so K Psi B Psi B K, but this inner product is one, right? So then we just have this sum for K of K, K, and because K is a basis, so this is on subsystem A, then this is just the identity on it. 
just like we wanted. Good. Let's look at one more example. So this is an example that is uh, represents white noise. It's a depolarizing channel as well. And if you take a course on quantum information theory or quantum computing, then you you look into this a lot because it's it's a very common way to model noise in a uh, that a quantum computer may be subject to. So this means that the states that we want, well, with probability one minus p, nothing happens. In probability p, it gets replaced with a fully mixed state. Uh, this could be, for example, in a qubit. And now we can make these probabilities even depend on time for a child that is applied many times or, or over a long period of time. So this means that this the state is going to get, if you looked at it on the block sphere, um, if you look at it on the block sphere and we start with the state that's even pure, with this channel, it's going to bring it a bit closer to the middle where we have the fully mixed state. So it gets more and more mixed depending on the number of times you apply this, depending on P. So here, it's also possible that from here, we extract the, the cross operators and we will do this in one exercise sheet, maybe not this week, but in a future one. And they look like this. There's four of them. Of four x p over four y. This being the poly matrices, and the four is going to be p over four z. Okay, we will not show it here, but you'll see later in an exercise class that this is the case. Which is to say, it's not always simple. It's not always obvious like how to get from the description of the map that is written in an intuitive way to the cross operators. But it's a very powerful description. Um, good, so after these examples, now let's see that this uh, cross decomposition actually always gives us a physical evolution. So I'll just write here that this is something we'll do in the tutorial. Okay, so let's just show that cross representation. Oh. Satisfies the desiderata one, two, and three in general. So first, we need to see that it's linear. And, well, okay, let's see. So we have rho applied to some pi rho i. Okay, that's a sum over k in this representation of a k, sum i pi i, a k dagger, right. But now because, um, so what's inside here does not depend on k, what's outside does not depend on i, we can swap the, uh, the two sums. So we can have sum over i, pi, and now we have again sum over k, e k, o i, e k dot, yeah. which is sum over i, Pi of the state applied to uh, the evolution applied to rho i, which is what we wanted, right? Good. Two, let's see that it's trace preserving, and this is where the the 
this is where this condition, this normalization condition will appear. So we have a trace of rule. Well, this is a trace of sum over k, ek rho ek dagger. And this is now where we use some properties of the trace. So remember that the trace was linear, which means that we can take the sum outside. So you get sum over k, trace of ek rho ek tag. Then remember that the trace was cyclic, which meant that we could move um, these operators inside to, 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 to the other side. So I'll just put here that the trace is cyclic. So this means that we have sum over k, trace of ek dagger, ek rho. And now we can use that this linear again to put the sum back in because we're getting to something that we like. Okay. So we get trace of sum over k, ek dagger, k. Okay, and this by the definition of the Krauss normalization, this is just the identity, so you get trace of the identity times rho, which is trace of rho. Good, so that's solved. And now then only one remaining thing is to check that it's completely positive. Okay, so let's take two subsystems. Um, A and let's call it an environment. Uh, okay, let's take a special case. So A, A dagger. So let's take the case where the second subsystem is a copy of the first subsystem. Uh, we actually, no, we don't need this. No, it could be anything. Sorry about that. Could be anything. Let's call it environment. Okay. And we just take the spectral decomposition, so the decomposition into the eigenstates of this whole thing. So it's pi. And here is going to be some states i, i that live on both subsystems. So we just take this big matrix that acts on the uh, lives on the two subsystems, and we just look, we just diagonalize it essentially. Yep. Good. And now we're going to see what happens when we apply E. The first one could take A to some other system B, and then we have some the identity function. Okay, that's why on E. And this whole thing is going to act on root A, E. OK. So we have the sum over K of what is this map doing. So we have this E K acting on A. Tensor, nothing happening on the system E for environment. Rho A, E, E K. Dagger tensor identity. Okay. Now, what is this whole thing? Now we just replace the row with uh, with the definition above, and we just introduce that it's linear already to take it outside because we showed that it was linear. Okay. E k times identity on e. And here comes our pure state. A e, e k dagger times the identity on e. Okay. 
Okay. Now this part here, this is just a convex combination where the PIs are positive, right? So this will not change the positivity of the whole thing. Uh, and here on the right, this is also going to be larger than zero for each state. Well, let's put here. This is going to be larger than zero for each of these uh, things because each of these psi i's is also. Uh, so each of the psi i's is um, normalized. And the identity does not do anything to it, does not change positivity. In this E case, because they're normalized as well, they also not change that the, that the overall state is positive. So overall, the whole thing is going to be larger than zero. And this might be something that you can do uh, by hand in the tutorial. Now, what's the problem with the, um, uh, with the cross decomposition is that it's not necessarily unique. Okay. So attention. Cross decomposition. It's not always unique. So in the same way that when you have a matrix, a density matrix, it's the composition into pure states it does not need to be unique. Right, like we saw before that you go uh, a uniform mixture of zero and one or uniform mixture of plus and minus, then they, they give rise to the same density matrix, right? So this is not unique and it might be relevant later. Okay, and we also see later, in fact, we'll see uh, very soon that measurements are an example of such a map, which we'll see very soon and also in the tutorial this week. Okay, so let's make a break here before looking into a different um, way to decompose them. Let me see how it looks. Okay. So now we're going to look into ways of seeing the states as um, sorry. a way of seeing this evolution as an evolu a large evolution in a, a pure evolution in a larger system followed by the partial trace in general. Okay, so let's take a break now. For so let me see where I was, okay. So again, where the cross decomposition representation represents all the states, but the intuition there is maybe not always so clear, but the intuition for this one will be very clear. So that's the idea that you have some system row A, and then it will evolve with some system U, and there might be some environment which can start um, initially in some state zero, E, and then we end up here with system B. So you'll end up with uh, epsilon of row A, which is system B to system A. And of course, something is lost that we trace out that's uh, gonna be, uh, let's call it E prime. Okay, such that the idea is that uh, H A tensor H E, this should have the same size, the same dimensions, I mean they are isomorphic to H B tensor H E prime. So this is the global picture, for example, if there's say that there exists n qubits here, and there exists k qubits here and m there, then here you should have well n plus k minus m qubits. But of course, this is more general. I'll put here an example. Okay. This is more general, does not limit itself to the case where we have qubits, could be other dimensions of systems. Okay, so the idea now is that um, we put first this thing here in the box. 
and we say that we call this whole thing V, which is an isometry. An isometry is a reversible evolution, but instead of going from a system to itself, it, it can go, for example, between systems of different dimensions. Okay, so I'll explain what this is in a second. This zero is just an ancilla or the environment. And here, of course, we take the partial trace at the end to get this thing in there. So what I mean is that you can see the map that goes from A to B, acting on rule A, as trace over this environment of what? An environment prime. Well, first of this U, U dagger, acting on what? On row A times this ancilla. Ancilla means like a helpful, just a helpful thing. So this went from A, E to B, E dagger, right? And this is the same. And that we can write in a more simple way E of. This V that goes from A to B E prime from A V dagger. Now, some things to, to have into account. So this V is defined exactly as it's here. Okay, it's just take just as takes a state, append a state zero on the on this environment, and apply the unitary U. That's just we're just defining V in this way. There are things that while U is a square matrix, um, V does not need to be a square matrix if, uh, if the dimension of A is more than the dimension of B and D prime together. So V is an isometry and U is unitary. That's the difference between the two. Okay, so this is called the dilation of the map uh, of the map E because we went from the view that of what happens only in this subsystem here, and we, we went from it to a, a more global view. But now we need to see how we go from one from one view of the of the map to another. So how to go from the sign spring dilation to the cross representation. So going from sign spring dilation to cross representation. And the idea is that we can write V as being a sum for K of EK tensor K on the environment. Where this operator is EK, they can they go from A to B. Where K is some basis. Um, which e. So let's see that this works. So first let's see that V is an isometry, which means that when multiplied by the dagger, it should be reversible. So we do V dagger V, which means in, it means we apply V and then we apply the reverse backwards. So if K L sum over E K prime K E L L K, but this sum over K and sum over L of E K dagger E L. Well, not tensor because we have now a number here K L. But because this was a basis, we know that this thing here is just it's 
uh, delta function. So we get sum over k of e k dagger e k, which if we assume that the cross representation that these e k daggers were um, the cross representation, then this would be the identity on the original system. And now let's just see that with this it works out. So then let's see what is E rho A. What's going to be the trace over E prime of V rho A V dagger. Let's do it one thing at a time. So let's do trace over E prime of what? What the thing up there? So uh, so okay of some over k. K tenses K row A no K tensor I oh, know sorry yes you're right here we need a sum over L E L E L dagger tensor L. Okay. Go. Cool. And now we can just replace so in fact let's just do this part first. So we have trace over e check. of now sum over k and l of e k for a l dagger tensor k l right. okay and now we need to take um, the partial trace But the partial trace is just the sum over some j's of nothing happening. So now notice that this thing lives on b. And this thing um, lives on e prime. Right. Okay, so now with the partial trace, so we have the systems B and E prime at this point. So we have identity on B, J there. And now that thing there. E, K, O, A, E, L, dagger. Okay, L. And now here again, identity on B and J on E prime. So nothing happens on B, so let's put here all the sums. J, K, L. Everything is linear, nothing happens on the first subsystem. H, K, O, A, E, L dagger. But now on the second subsystem, we have first this J attaching here and the RJ attaching there. So we have J L, oh, sorry, JK. And then we have L J. So we've got two deltas, which means that two of these sums go away. 
Uh, let's call it just K, the one that stays for some K. EK. So this is how we went directly from the from the Stein spring dilation to the Krauss decomposition by choosing the isometry. Okay, we just chose this isometry where these EKs are the Krauss operators. So what does this tell us? Remember that I told you before that uh, the same map can have different Krauss decompositions. But the, the global evolution, the global reversible evolution, is determined by these operators, by the cross operators. It just tells us that even the same map, even the map looks the same locally here, it can have different cross decompositions which correspond to different global uh, evolutions. So this just means that we have different global evolutions that have the same local effect. Okay, so, for example, something very strange could be happening here on, on this system. It could maybe be exchanging these qubits of order or applying some rotation there or whatnot, but we don't detect it locally. So this is what it means to have the ma a map that has different, um, different crowds representations. Good. So I'll just write this down. Uh, what is this right? So different crowds. Uh, what's the global presentation? This corresponds to different global evolutions. With the same local effect. Good. Okay, so now let's see an example. And we can look at, at an example that we saw in previous uh, lectures. Although one of the main applications of this is, like I say, when you talk about interactions with some unknown environment of an environment of which you only have very little information, uh, like in the case of noise. But uh, we saw before, so an application to measurements. This is what we saw uh, a few lectures ago. So we had some system A that had, and we wanted to determine some, the value of some observable there, right? And then we looked at this um, interaction Hamiltonian that was essentially like the, the modular momentum on a pointer system. And the, <coughs> and the, um, and the observable on the system that I want to measure. And we started from some uh, initial state, which was very conveniently, in this case, like kind of diagonal for this observable and, and a very neat initial state of the pointer, right? Then we looked at what happens in this evolution and we got that it was indeed exactly this kind of uh, correlated state at the end, right? So one of the examples that we saw was in the double slit experiment. And this is something that you'll see in the, um, this is something that you see in the tutorial now, is how do we go from this global evolution to the effect that it had on the, on the local state. And indeed, in the case of the, of the double slit experiment, the state that we got here on this side, they're all ortho, orthonormal. It was I did flip the spin or I did not flip the spin. So it's um, so in the end, if you look at what you get here, you get exactly the reduced state as if you had gotten uh, 
this outcomes with the, with the probabilities given by the CIs. So um, I think I will let you do this first in the tutorial, and then we'll do it we'll do it in the lecture afterwards because I think it's nicer to have you try it first over there. Okay. So I think actually I might. I tell you what, I will stop the lecture here and I'll give another half an hour on the Thursday lecture, uh, which you obviously are not forced to watch uh, live because then I can group things more with topic. So this way in the next lecture, I can start talking about thermodynamics, which now I don't think I would have time to uh, get into much detail because you only have half an hour left. Okay, so I'll stop here and we'll continue on Thursday. Okay, thank you.